I probably don't need to say it, but you know, for a class like this, it's always really good to have Bibles. Um, and there are Bibles in the back if, if you don't have one. Um, and I always prefer uh, for you know, detailed study, it's always good to have an actual physical Bible. It's really hard to kind of move back and forth between texts. Um, and you don't notice things as much when you're on your phone on a, uh, looking at a Bible. So uh, anyway, that's just my humble opinion. Um, <laughs> anyway, last week, uh, just a little bit of review there. We really just covered basically two verses, 16 and 17, which uh, were kind of Paul's thesis statement for the whole book of Romans. And uh, we tried to unpack that a little bit, some of the terminology uh, that's very important. And, uh, and then we're going to launch today into the first main section of Romans, um, looking at it first from the big picture of that section and then kind of breaking down um, the first unit of that. So, um, so on the review there, Paul's special commission to preach to Gentiles, um, although we know that he also was very concerned about his own people, the Jews, and uh, this is something he'll talk about later in Romans 9 through 11. Number two, the gospel is for salvation of everyone, but to the Jew first, and that's something we've talked about quite a bit, that Israel has a special vocation to bring the good news of the gospel to the rest of the world. Um, the gospel reveals the righteousness of God. Um, talked about that, what that word means uh, last week a little bit, and we're going to look at that in a little more detail this morning as well. Um, God's covenant faithfulness, which is part of what? God's righteousness means is that God is faithful to his covenant promises, um, faithful to bring justice to his good creation, um, faithful to particularly to the promise to Abraham um, so that Jesus kind of fulfills the covenant with Abraham, even though Israel did not really fulfill its covenant with God, did not fulfill its vocation uh, properly to be a light to the Gentiles. Um, and so Jesus is kind of like Israel reduced to one um, in the story of the New Testament. And then finally, we talked about the role of faith and works, uh, the complementary nature of those, which is something we'll, we'll talk about more as we get through uh, different sections of the book. So the big picture here, and some of you, I think, are probably already filling out these blanks, um, but Paul's really concerned in this first major section through uh, chapter 3 to show the universal need of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he doesn't really have a lot of difficulty in convincing Jews that Gentiles are sinners and need the gospel. Um, his real problem is in convincing Jews and even Christian Jews even Jews who have accepted Jesus as Messiah into understanding the depth of their own sinfulness. And so what Paul does is kind of start with the, the Gentiles and, uh, and then kind of almost secretly kind of jump into uh, pointing the finger at his own people. And, uh, and so if we wanted to kind of encapsulize this, uh, Gentiles know God through what? What's the end there? Natural, or uh, below I put general revelation, but um, and some people argue about the difference between those two, but we won't do that. Uh, natural revelation, right? Whereas the Jew knows God through what? Special revelation, right? God has revealed himself in a special way to Israel, has given revelation to Moses, has given revelation to Abraham, has spoken to Israel through the prophets, right? Those are all elements of special revelation. Gentiles can know God as what kind of God? What? Creator, yeah, creator God, good. Gentiles can know God as a creator God, right? Jews know God as what? Covenant God, right? They know the special name of Yahweh, the special covenant name of Yahweh. 
Uh, Gentiles, I mean, they can, they can call God El or Elohim. Those are very generic terms in the ancient Near East. Matter of fact, the word Allah, right, comes from El. It's related to the name for God in Hebrew. Um, Gentiles can be guided by conscience. Okay, Paul talks about that later in chapter 2. That even though Gentiles who don't have the Torah, they don't have the law, they can, they have a law in some sense within themselves. And they're guided, you know, not always perfectly, <laughs> uh, just like we're not always guided very perfectly by our conscience. But that is an element which we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, Jews, of course, are guided by the law, or as Paul would say, the Torah, right? The Torah. Now, what Paul wants to get to at the end of his argument uh, are verses that most of us are probably familiar with, right? All, both Jew and Gentile, are under the power of sin. Okay? It doesn't matter which side you're on here. There is no one, right? Very absolute language here who is righteous, not even one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay? So this is kind of the big picture of what Paul's trying to do in this section. Now, to kind of understand what he does in, in 118 and following, um, we'll go through this paradigm, which those of you who have been in the class are familiar with. We've gone through it when we talked about Genesis. We've gone through it when we've talked about wisdom literature in the Old Testament. Um, but we have here the two types of revelation, right? So we'll start on the right, general revelation. Um, general revelation is bilateral, right? People can view the created order. People can view the heavens. Um, and Paul's expectation is that they will then see something that draws them to a creator, right? They look at the creation, they see the glory, the power, the beauty, the intricacy of the creation. Um, and so they hopefully then will see that there's a creator. And God himself is speaking in this way through what he has created, right? The creation is like the fingerprint of God in that way. Now, on this side, this is unilateral, right? This is special revelation in which God has revealed himself in some special way. It could be through scripture, it could be through angels, it could be through dreams or visions or uh, any other kinds of, of uh, methods in which God specifically chooses certain people, right? Now, the classical text for this idea is in Psalm 19. So if you have your Bibles, we'll just kind of briefly, I'm not going to unpack it completely, but um, just so you understand how Jews understood these two types of revelation, right? Psalm 19, the heavens are telling the what? The glory, the glory of God, right? They're speaking in some way about the glory of God. Now, the word that's used there in Hebrew uh, is El or Elohim, plural. The firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech. Night to night declares knowledge. Okay, it's saying this is incessant kind of general revelation. It's always happening, right? People can go out at any time of day or night, look out at the creation and study it. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth. He's saying there's not an audible kind of revelation here, and yet there's still communication about who God is. There are words to the end of the world, right? It's, it's not limited to some spot or space in the world. In the heavens, he sent a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy. Like a strong man runs his course with joy. Um, yeah, we don't need to go over that. Now, in verse 7, it all of a sudden changes to special revelation. The law of the... 
Lord, right? Not El or Elohim, the law of the Lord, the covenant God, the, gov the covenant God who has revealed himself very specifically to Israel through the law, through the Torah. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. And then it goes on to talk a lot about um, the special revelation of God. So we have the book of scripture and we have the book of nature, right? Two ways in which God can reveal himself. Now, Paul is not going to argue that people can know, have a saving relationship with God just on the basis of general revelation alone, right? You can become a theist on the basis of general revelation, right? I believe in God. Uh, but you can't become a Christian because you have to understand the incarnation, right? You have to understand the special revelation of God in Jesus Christ. And so these two things need to work together. Um, but to see how that works, you know, even in a life, like in the special revelation, we have, you shall not commit adultery, right? We all know that from the Ten Commandments. Um, but in general revelation, like when you're reading Proverbs, um, Ecclesiastes, parts of Job, some of the Psalms, right? Those are general revelation. They start out as general revelation. They start out as people observing the world, right? People just looking out, just seeing how things work, reading the newspaper. Oh, yeah, look what happened, right? So when you read in Proverbs 5 through 7 about adultery, um, it's just, it, it understands the special revelation, but it's, but it's looking at what happens to people in real life when they do commit adultery, and it says, basically, you're an idiot. Be careful. It's going to burn you. It's like lighting a fire in your lap. Who does that? Right? And all we have to do is read the newspaper. Josh Duggar, Tiger Woods, David Petraeus, John Edwards. Did it go well for them? No. Right? So general revelation backs up. Because the Ten Commandments, they don't say why to do this. It doesn't explain, don't commit adultery because blah, 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 right? But then when you look out at it life, it's, it's what we call character consequence, right? When you read Proverbs, it's about your character will elicit this kind of consequence. If you do this, this will happen, right? And this is very important to understand kind of for the background of what Paul's talking about here. Wisdom tradition was a very important tradition in the ancient Near East. It's not just a Jewish thing. It's something that actually is earlier than, than Israelites in Judaism. Moses, right? There's a quote there. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, was powerful in speech and action. How about Solomon, right? That's the guy we really associate with, with wisdom. People came from all the nations to hear the wisdom of Solomon they came from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. Everybody's into wisdom in the ancient Near East. And we'll see examples of this in a minute. C.S. Lewis at the bottom there um, has an interesting little book on the Psalms. The doctrine of creation leaves nature full of manifestations which show the presence of God and created energies which serve him. The light is his garment. The thunder can be his voice. He dwells in the dark thundercloud. The eruption of a volcano comes in answer to his touch. The world is full of his emissaries and executors. He makes winds his messengers and flames his servants. To say that God created nature, while it brings God and nature into relation, also separates them. What makes and what is made must be two, not one. Thus, the doctrine of creation, in one sense, empties nature of divinity. Okay? This is really fundamental to understanding Paul's point here, which is a very Jewish point, right? That if we look out at the world and we, and we understand that it didn't just happen by accident, and we understand that there's a creator, uh, it makes sense that there's one creator, right? That monotheism uh, is, is, is something that makes sense. And this is the, the centrality of the Jewish confession, right? Morning and evening, they say the Shema, 
right? Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Echad. Everybody, most of you, I've, I've said this several times in this class, right? Echad, what does that mean? God is one. There is one God. There is one creator God. And this is what Paul is going to launch into. So this kind of sets us up for Romans 1.18, where Paul begins his diagnosis of the human condition. For, now, if you have an NIV, unfortunately, does not have the word for, but Paul is purposely tying to the previous two verses, the little thesis statement, right? 16 and 17. And the NIV, unfortunately, leaves out four several times in this chapter. But So you're missing the connections that, that Paul is trying to make, which I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made. So they are without excuse, for though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, their senseless minds were darkened, Claiming to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling a mortal human being or birds or four-footed animals or reptiles. Paul here, when he talks about the exchange, you've, you've exchanged here the glory of God for the worship of idols. He's, he's actually referring partly to Psalm 106, verse 20, where it talks about the Israelites who have exchanged the worship of the one true God for the worship of idols. And, of course, for a Jew, this is like the first and second commandment, right, of the Decalogue. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make idols, right? So if, if it's the most important commandment, uh, then it's also the most important issue to deal with in a person's relationship with God. And when we read the Genesis creation story, the, the, one of the main points in the Genesis story is not to tell us how God created or when God created. The writer's not interested in that. He is interested in telling us who God is and what his relationship to the creation is, right? When he creates the sun, when he creates the moon, when he creates the light, when he creates the seas, the writer is saying, these are not God. God created these. They're, they're under his power. He controls them. They are not God. And in Deuteronomy 4, there's a summary of this when God has to remind the Israelites themselves, since you saw no form, 4.15, when the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the fire, take care and watch yourselves closely so that you do not act corruptly by making an idol for yourselves in the form of any figure. The likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water under the sea. When you look up to the heavens and see the sun, the moon, the stars, all the host of heaven, do not be led astray and bow down to them and serve them. Things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples everywhere under heaven. But the Lord has taken you, brought you out of the iron smelter, out of Egypt, to become a people of his very own possession, as you are now. So this is so central to, to what Paul is talking about here, about what Gentiles do, right? And of course... Not just what Gentiles do, but what Israelites have done in the past. Is that they look at the creation and they stop here, right? 
wow, isn't this beautiful? Isn't this creation lovely? Let's, let's build a statue, uh, you know, of a, of a bull and let's worship it. Let's build, you know, statues. Let's make these nice, beautiful statues out of gold to Athena and to Mars and to Apollo and to Neptune. And let's worship those, you know, because they represent, of course, the creation, right? Neptune represents the sea. And so Paul's problem here, which is a very Jewish problem, I mean, you could read him here and just think he's a Jew, right? Is that Gentiles have stopped here, and this is a problem of worship, isn't it? It's a problem of misdirected worship, of, yes, we're, we're willing to worship, that's not a problem, but what are we worshiping? That's the problem. And all commentators are, are agreed that Paul here is also being influenced by other Jewish writings. And uh, one of the Jewish writings that was very popular in Judaism in between the Testaments and popular in the early church as well uh, is a book called The Wisdom of Solomon. And there are several places in Romans 1 and 2 where Paul touches bases with that book. Now, Protestants sometimes have a problem with that because this is in, quote, the Apocrypha. Um, but uh, I think we need to understand the tradition a little bit better here. And uh, the Apocrypha is in a Roman Catholic Bible. The Apocrypha is in the Orthodox Bible. The Apocrypha was in a Protestant Bible, the King James Bible, till the late 1800s. So it doesn't mean you have to accept it as scripture, but you have to accept that it's very influential and that it's useful to read. Matter of fact, in Rome, um, there's a, the Muratory Canon, which is a canon list. We have several canon lists from the early church where they're trying to decide which books are going to be in the New Testament, right? And the Muratory Canon is a Roman canon from the end of the second century AD. And it lists the Gospels and Paul, and then towards the end, I put a little quote there. Further, an epistle of Jude, two with the title John, are accepted in the Catholic Church. Catholic small c, which means what? The universal church, yeah, we're not talking Roman Catholic. And the wisdom, written by friends of Solomon in his honor. So we're talking about the wisdom of Solomon. Martin Luther, um, he translated all the Apocrypha in, in his Bible, but he put, them, uh, put the Apocrypha in between the Old and New Testament. And that's the way you often see it today. So He says, these books are not held equal to the sacred scriptures and yet are useful and good for reading. John Calvin, what is held in the book of wisdom concerning the origin of idols is received virtually by public consent. Okay. So I just put one chapter, but actually we'll look at some more. Chapter 13 and 14 are very similar to what Paul's doing. Um, For all people who are ignorant of God were foolish by nature. They were unable from the good things that are seen to know the one who exists. Nor did they recognize the artisan while paying heed to his works. But they supposed that either fire or wind or swift air or the circle of the stars or turbulent water or the luminaries of heaven were the gods that rule the world. If through delight in the beauty of these things people assumed them to be gods, let them know how much better than these is their Lord. For the author of beauty created them. And if people were amazed at their power in working, Let them perceive from them how much more powerful is the one who formed them. For from the greatness and beauty of created things comes a corresponding perception of their creator. Yet these people are little to be blamed, for perhaps they go astray while seeking God and desiring to find him. For while they live among his works, they keep searching. They trust in what they see, because the things that are seen are beautiful. Yet again... Not even they are to be excused. Notice how similar that language is, right, to Paul. For if they had the power to know so much that they could investigate the world, how did they fail to find sooner the Lord of these things? Now, I mean, we have a greater advantage today, right, uh, with science. And uh, how many of you ever seen pictures of the space, Hubble Space Telescope? out in the farthest reaches of the universe, right? 
How many of you have watched, uh, Netflix has a series now called Our Planet. Anybody watch that? You should watch that. It makes you praise God. I'm serious. You watch that and you just go, wow. You see the intricacies. You see the symbiotic relationship between all the different created beings on this earth. You see the interdependency of life on the earth. Anybody ever seen Terrence Mollick's film, The Tree of Life? It's based on the book of Job in our Bible. It's, it's just magnificent. Um, Brad Pitt. Yeah, if you like Brad Pitt, you can watch him. But uh, there's a sequence in there of the creation. It's just mesmerizing of the intricacies of the, the birth of the universe to the little baby uh, seed being born. And, and of course, today we have people who, who can look at the creation in very intricate detail. And it, does, it has changed people's lives, right? It's drawn them to theism. It's drawn them to God. Um, years ago, on my, one of my birthdays, my wife gave me this book, Cosmos Bios Theos. Uh, Scientists reflect on science, God, and the origins of the universe. Um, and, and I have a ton of books on science. Uh, Alistair McGrath, The Science of God. Okay, Alistair McGrath uh, had a PhD in biochemistry from Oxford um, and then decided, wow, there must be a God. There must be a designer. And now he's like one of the top theologians uh, in the world. He writes way too many books. Um, can't keep up with him. I got this from my mom years ago. Um, Francis Collins uh, was head of the Human Genome Project also an atheist, became a Christian, wrote The Language of God. A scientist presents evidence for belief in the language of God. And, and what happens in those cases is, is they start on this side, right, of the picture of general revelation, and then they, and then they move to that side. And it's, it's a whole package there. Well, moving on then, what, what Paul recognizes... Um, because of his, his own tradition and because of the, the revelation in, in the Old Testament, um, is that every human being is created in the image of God, right? Every human being has this, what we call, imago Dei uh, stamped onto them. They have this divine conscience. And there's this general revelation so that we have examples, we have lots of examples of of laws that are much earlier than the Old Testament laws, which are very similar, right? So it's not like God, like the Israelites made this up or God, you know, just introduced this as something completely new. Tobin, do you have the overhead of that? So we'll just, I'll show you a few examples. All right, so ancient Near Eastern law codes. If a noble has destroyed the eye of a member of the aristocracy, they shall destroy his eye. If a noble has knocked out the tooth of another noble, it should knock out his tooth. This is Code of Hammurabi, right? It's like way earlier than the Old Testament, right? Well, we're all familiar with that one, right? Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, right? Uh, they recognize that. Um, if a wife of a noble has been caught lying with another man, they shall bind him and throw him in the river. <laughs> okay. Uh, so they understood about adultery, right? Now, what that means, if you read those law codes, throw them in the Euphrates River. Uh, they said, well, if he comes up and, and, and survives, he was innocent. <laughs> if he drowns, well, I guess he was guilty, right? Um, if an ox gores another ox, causes its death, both the owners shall divide the price of the live ox and also the worth of the dead ox. Someone's ox hurts the ox of another uh, so that it dies, then it shall, I mean, you can see the parallel there. The laws of Eshnuna are very much earlier than the Old Testament, right? Uh, wisdom literature, a lot of parallels. Um, Proverbs 22 actually is, is, is partly influenced by this earlier Egyptian writing called the Wisdom of Amenemope. <laughs> Great name. Uh, don't associate with a hothead, become intimate with him. I mean, these, the parallels are almost exact as you kind of work through this. Um, you can move up a little bit, Tobin. 
uh, better is poverty in the hand of God. Okay, God, there's ancient Near Eastern understanding of God and riches in the storehouse. Keep going. Psalms, hymns of praise. Um, just as a servant is wont to commit uh, something missing there. So the Lord uh, commits sin, I think is what, it, what it's supposed to say there. So the Lord is wont to forgive. The Lord of Thebes does not spend the whole day being angry. If he becomes angry in an instant, it no longer lasts. Wow, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? God's anger lasts but for a moment, right? His favor for a lifetime. Um, there was a period in, in ancient Egypt where there was monotheism, right? It's very radical. A guy named Akhenaten decided, hey, there's only one God. It's just the sun God. And, uh, and so you have these very monotheistic kind of hymns of praise to, to Aten. Soul God, without another beside you, you create the earth as you wish when you were by yourself. Before mankind, all cattle and livestock, all creatures on land, who fare upon their feet, all creatures in the air fly with their wings. You know, you read Isaiah 45, 46, 47, you know, it's like 10 times God says, I am the Lord, there is no other, I made the earth, you know, why are you looking around? Does it make any sense that like Buddha created part of it and, you know, Krishna created another part of it? No, that doesn't make any sense at all. Ethical admonitions, requite with kindness your evildoer, maintain justice to your enemy, smile on your adversary, nurture your ill-wisher. Well, we're familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, right, and what Jesus says there. But, I mean, these, these ethical understandings are, are kind of built into human beings. Um, this is one of my favorites in Exodus. When you come upon your enemy's ox or donkey going astray, you shall bring it back. When you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden, you must help set it free, right? It's like, it's like path rage. <laughs> okay, some Mustang comes up behind you, right? And, and, and you're looking in your mirror and you're getting all, you know, mad and, and he just passes you, right? And, and then you see him lying in a ditch. And what do you say? <laughs> you deserve that, buddy. Right? God says, no, that's not the way my people should be. You take care of your enemy's donkey. You take care of your enemy's car. Right? It's nothing new. So, moving on then on the sheet there, the revelation of the wrath of God. So, Paul starts out right with verse 18. The wrath of God, NIV says, is being revealed, okay? And it's, it's important it's because it is present tense here. It's present continuous tense here. His wrath is being revealed. So it's not just like wrath is something you're waiting for the distant future. Paul is saying God's wrath is already being revealed now. And the word revealed is apocalypsis. It's where we get the word apocalypse, right? Same word for the book of Revelation. It means an unveiling. It means I, I, I'm showing you something now that was hidden. God's wrath was hidden. It's now being revealed. And so this is an anticipation of the future wrath of God. Uh, Paul still expects a future day of judgment. Anticipation of the final future wrath of God. Uh, a little bit later in chapter 2, Paul says, By your hard and impenitent heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself for the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Well, here it's already being revealed. B, the relationship of God's wrath to God's righteousness. Okay, so here's where it's really important to kind of see the connection. Like, most of your Bibles have some kind of editorial heading right before verse 18, right? Right? kind of makes you think, oh, okay, new section. Uh, and yet, in the verse right before it, in verse 17, he says, in the gospel, a righteousness from God is being revealed. Same word, apocalypsis, is being revealed. It's present tense. The righteousness of God is being revealed. At the same time, the wrath of God is being revealed, right? They're related to each other. And Paul says it's against all unrighteousness. Now, here's, here's where sometimes you, you just miss things because Paul 
he uses words very purposely, and he uses contrasting words very purposely, and sometimes translations, they don't do a great job of showing you that, right? Righteousness, I put on your sheet there, Greek word, kaiasune, right? Unrighteousness, oops, I better not write in Greek. Um, you put an A in front of it, right? That, what does that do? It negates it, right? And so he's contrasting here the righteousness of God with the unrighteousness of human beings. So uh, in verse 18, against all ungodliness, and then the second word is translated wickedness, which makes it sound really generic, but it's not generic. It's connected to God's righteousness, and this is unrighteousness, right? It's, 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 it's injustice is really what the word means is that people are being unjust. People are not living up to what they were created to be in the image of God. And God, being a just God, has to do something about that. He can't just let it go. He's the creator. And so God must deal with the consequences of sin to be faithful to his creation and to his covenant. That's what it means that when God said, when Paul says he's, the righteousness of God is being revealed. There's a, as I mentioned last week, I mean, Paul is constantly kind of breathing out his understanding of, of God. It comes from the Psalms and Isaiah in particular. But I mean, I'll just read you one psalm that really speaks to this context here. Psalm 96. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be revered above all the gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering. Come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before him, all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord is king. It's not Caesar. The world is firmly established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming. He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and his peoples with truth. I mean, Paul's not making this stuff up right? This is just something that's been infused with him even before he met Jesus Christ. He understands who God is. He understands how the world works. And he understands now how Jesus Christ fits into that big picture. And so when he says that God's wrath is revealed against those who suppress the truth, right? What does that mean? Well, he uses that phrase several times, right? Suppress the truth. A little bit later in verse 25, because they exchanged the truth about God, right? That's what the truth is. It's the truth about who God is. It's about God as creator. It's about the Shema, about God as one. It's about Isaiah 45 through 47, where God says 10 times, I am God and there is no other. Do I need to remind you? I'm God, there is no other. I'm the first and the last. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, right? It just kind of keeps repeat. God keeps repeating himself there. So then, what is wrath? You know, we, we hear that word, and you, you automatically associate certain things with that word that are very, very negative, right? If somebody's wrathful, it's kind of like you don't think too positively about that. That's not really what it means in this, in this context, you know, we, we think of like that picture of, of Thor or Zeus. I don't even know who that is on the right there. Thunderbolts and lightning, very, very frightening. feel like singing Queen's song there. Um, 
God is not Zeus. God is not Thor, right? The wrath for Paul, the wrath of God is part of the good news, which just seems kind of ironic. But the wrath of God is, is something about the way God has made the world to work. The world was designed in a certain way, and it reveals kind of this reap what you sow principle. It's kind of built into the creation. If somebody does this, then this happens, right? And so when Paul is talking about the wrath of God, he's just building on the Jewish understanding of the wrath of God, that, that people reap what they sow. So I put a few verses there. I have consumed them with, this is talking about the Israelites, I've consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Okay, well, what does that mean, God? Well, the next verse or phrase tells you, I have returned their conduct upon their heads. Whatever they wanted to do, I let them do it. I didn't step in. I will visit upon you the fruit of your actions. Jeremiah 21. And actually, your translations there, instead of visit upon, they'll say punish. But it's actually not really any Hebrew word in the Old Testament which has the, the English sense of punish. So it's not a great translation. It, it, it's, I'll visit upon you the fruit of your actions. I'll, I'll, I'll let the fruit of your actions kind of do to you what they should do. Visiting the iniquity of the parents on the children. Well, that sounds kind of harsh. <clears throat> Is he saying that children are going to pay the penalty of sin of their parents? Not exactly. But it is talking about generational sin and the generational effects of sin, right? In Deuteronomy, it actually says that a child, a son, shall not die for his father's mistake. Each shall die for their own sin, right? But we all know the principle that sometimes parents, what parents do affects children right, down to, through generations, right? And that's what it's talking about. A couple of nights ago, my wife and I watched a movie called Into the Wild. Anybody seen that? I read the book, John, John Krakauer. It's a sad story, right? And it's a sad story which has its underpinnings in the, in the life of the parents of this boy who did not treat each other very well, who had infidelities, who were very harsh, husband and wife with children. And this caused this boy who had, was a brilliant kid who went to Emory University, graduated top of his class, to just chuck it all and go travel around the country and eventually his life goal was to go where? To Alaska, all right? And every person he meets on his travels says to him, where are your parents? Have you told your parents where you are? No, he just shuts them completely off. I don't want to talk about my parents. And so he lives in this bus, abandoned out in nowhere in Alaska until he eats, he gets very hungry and he eats something he shouldn't eat. And he dies alone, but he keeps a journal. And one of the last things in his journal is he finally understands that happiness, to be happiness, needs to be shared. You're not going to find it alone. And it's, it, it's a sad story that's played out, you know, in lots of movies, in lots of books, and in lots of real-life family situations in which the actions and attitudes of, of us as parents will affect our kids. So it's, it's, a, it's a warning. Even the Book of Wisdom, which I mentioned earlier, so that they might learn that one is punished by the very things by which one sins. Right? And, th and that leads into Paul's phrase, which he repeats several times, like in verse 24, and then we're going to see it come up again in the next section. Therefore, God gave them up. All right? God gave them up, gave them up, gave them up. Paul keeps repeating this. And it's important to understand what that means. Um, he, again, is following Old Testament tradition. Um, Psalm 81, my people would not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. Therefore, I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own devices. Okay, you want to go that way? Go for it. When your children sinned against him, 
This is Job's comforters. He gave them over to the penalty of their sin. Now, it's, 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 it's a God estranged kind of determination, right? That, that a person is determined to be estranged from someone or something. And that leads into a path which, which has kind of some inevitable kinds of consequences to it. But the important thing in Romans is to understand that gave them up does not mean give up on them. That Paul does not mean that God is giving up. To give them up is different from giving up on them. And there's a, there's a good quote at the bottom on this that kind of explains that. That divine judgment and divine tears go together has considerable theological import. Without the references to divine tears, God would be much more removed and unmoved. Judgment accompanied by weeping, though still judgment, is different in motivation, and in the understanding of the relationship at stake. God's harsh words of judgment are not matched by inner harshness. The strategy is to portray the kind of God with whom Israel and indeed the world has to do, a God for whom judgment can be productive of hope. Although God may give the people up to the effects of their sinfulness, God does not finally give up on them. God's judgment is always in the service of the ultimate will of God to save. To that end, God can use judgmental effects for a variety of positive purposes, such as refining, cleansing, insight, and discipline. God is a father, right? What father wants to see their kid go through anguish? God is a divine parent. And yes, sometimes he has to practice tough love, right? But it's still love. It's still caring. It's still hoping that somehow through this trial that people will come back and be reunited. Um, I'm going to close with a quote from N.T. Wright. As we've been talking about idolatries and uh, we sometimes, you know, just look at these passages and think of Roman and Greek gods, um, but we have our own idols as well. Our generation has seen the resurgence in the Western world of various forms of paganism. The worship of blood and soil and the symbols that evoke them was characteristic of the Nazi movement and remains all too familiar within the tribal and geographical disputes that still disfigure our planet. The worship of mammon, Granting absolute sovereignty to economic forces, whatever the human cost, is endemic in much contemporary culture of both the East and West. Eros, the god of sexual love, claims millions of devotees who genuinely believe they are bound to obey its every dictate, however many times its grandiose promises prove hollow. Mars, the god of war, is worshipped by many, tolerated by many more, and still wreaks havoc. And serious nature worship is on the increase as the old god of 18th century deism has disappeared from view, leaving a vacuum to be filled by the forces within the created order, producing various kinds of pantheism. Okay, I mean, it's, it's no different, right? We're still stopping here, worshiping the creation. We cannot then dismiss Paul's analysis of idolatry as relevant only to his own age. In some cases, we can easily see how such idolatry leads to dehumanized and dehumanizing behavior. When, for instance, worship of mammon by the few leads to widespread poverty for the many, and when faced with a call to remit large-scale and unpayable international debt, many in positions of power and financial security kick and scream rather than give up a single dollar of owed interest. Paul's thesis that dehumanizing behavior is rooted in the worship of idols deserves full contemporary exploration. Let's pray. Father, root out from us the idols that we have around us, the idols we allow with our own lives, our families, our culture. Help us to think very penetratively about these words and about your own loving kindness, your covenant love, and your righteousness. Thank you for your word, in Jesus' name, amen. I don't have to do music, so if any of you want to discuss anything, I'll be here.